So first off, I've got two things actively in the works and one thing in my head. I'm wrapping up writing my look at how important it is to get your difficulty right. We'll look at the campaign of Destiny 2, Titanfall 2's campaign played on Master Difficulty, Cuphead, and Fury, and examine how poorly balancing difficulty can make a game play completely different than it's intended to. Second, my daughter wanted to play The Sims 4. I looked into buying it only to find that it's actually cheaper to buy EA Origins Access. That worked out well because I've been considering doing a video on Dead Space for its 10 year anniversary. And after playing the first three games, I decided instead to look at Dead Space 2. In hindsight, it is a near masterpiece and it makes EA shuddering a visceral very hard to bear. And of course, I will be reviewing Destiny 2's Warmind DLC. I already bought the fucker, so... But today, we're going to do something rare for the channel. We are going to examine a game I absolutely love. God of War, released of course as a PlayStation exclusive, and it departs significantly from previous entries in the series. So today, we're going to break down God of War 2018. We'll look at its map, its progression, its visual presentation. We'll drill down on combat and enemy design. We'll take a long gander at its narrative and especially all the changes and try to figure out exactly why this game succeeds so well. As always, if you like what I have to say, or how I sound saying it, do me and you a favor and share, subscribe, like, comment, all that. Okay, it's basically impossible to look at this game without talking about how it simultaneously changes almost everything while somehow still staying true to the gameplay loop and flow of the first games. So as we often do, let's get a brief history out of the way. Actually, this time it, it won't be so brief. The History of War God of War 2018 makes an awful lot of changes to the series, and to really appreciate that, we're going to have to dig a little deeper than usual. One of the things that interests me most about this game is that the developer, and the game itself, has now existed through several eras of gaming. God of War has been a hit title on the PS2, the PS3, the PS Vita, and flip phones and touchscreen phones. And all of that time, it stayed pretty true to form. God of War was developed by Santa Monica Studios, with David Jaffe having the original idea for the design. After wrapping up production on their first game, the successful arcade racing game Kinetica, Jaffe, like me a child of the 80s and a fan of Jason of the Argonauts and Clash of the Titans, decided he wanted to make a game like Capcom's then recently released Onimusha Warlords, but quote unquote with Greek mythology. Ultimately the game ended up being quite a bit different than that, but the basic hack and slasher way through a supernatural historical period themes are indeed quite similar. God of War was an immediate big hit, both critically and commercially. It ended up combining tight, fluid, gamey hack and slash combo combat, mature themes, although not necessarily a mature story, extreme violence, well-designed puzzles and platforming, and very well-constructed old-school style pattern recognition boss fights. I went back and played 2 and 3 before writing this, and the games hold up surprisingly well with one exception. The narrative of the early games swung from cringy to passable. The maturity of the games didn't come from its narrative or its characters or its plot, it came from its intense gory violence and its sexual themes. These weren't games for kids, but they weren't games for adults either. They were games for young adults, for the 18 to 25 year old market. Young men who neither expected, or even really wanted, heavy themes and artsy narratives in their games. God of War Grows Up a modern camera. One of the signature features of those old God of War games was a fixed camera system. God of War was developed and released at the transition point between the era of the fixed camera and the fully controllable 3D camera. Going back and playing the game now, it's striking just how strange it is to play a fixed camera game. Even though God of War 3 isn't very old, it feels like a game from a different era. While the game began development after the revolutionary camera system of Super Mario 64 and on the first console to feature a second analog stick, games of that time were still struggling to fully and successfully integrate fully interactive third-person cameras. Super Mario 64 allowed the player to control the camera, but it wasn't a particularly fluid system. Super Mario Sunshine, which released in the same year that God of War began development, is notorious for its poorly implemented camera system. And for every game in the early aughts that got their interactive camera right, there were five with game-breaking cameras. But the early aught players were just as used to a fixed camera, or a tracking camera, as they were to the fully interactive cameras that have come to dominate games today. 
If you're interested in this topic, my Shadow of the Colossus video is basically 30 plus minutes on the importance of a camera system, so you can check that out. All that's to say that it's impossible to talk about the classic God of War games and the challenge of bringing them into the current generation without addressing the camera. Santa Monica Studios made four console God of War games and they all featured a fixed camera with only very occasional tracking sections. And at no point had Santa Monica ever developed a game with a fully controllable camera. As with all games, the camera system and perspective used in the early God of Wars were a crucial aspect of the gameplay itself. This fixed camera system served that gameplay well by allowing the developers to create intricate puzzle rooms and grand epic set pieces through cinematic camera controls. A fixed camera allowed for a certain degree of level exploration by cleverly hiding objects, chests, and objectives from the player through the use of force perspective. Much of what made those old God of War games memorable was the ridiculous cinematic set pieces that a fixed camera allowed. If you got a few hours and the PSN Game Pass thing or a spare 19 bucks, I highly recommend buying and playing the PS4 remaster of God of War 3. It's an amazing look into just how far games have come in the last 10 years. It is exceedingly well designed. Good combat. Great puzzles. Beautiful, intricate levels, but I can't tell you how many times I rolled Kratos because I forgot and tried to use the right stick to control the camera. This fixed camera was one of the few things that made a God of War game a God of War game, yet it's also that very camera system that made another game of this style unlikely to be a hit. The modern player simply isn't used to not having control of the camera anymore. The move to a fully interactive 3D camera for the new God of War was both absolutely needed and incredibly risky. Let's all remember that God of War 3 released 8 years ago to huge sales and tremendous critical praise. How many developers would make a huge, fundamental change to a Golden Goose IP coming off a top selling game that got a 92 Metacritic score? A 92! Most developers won't even consider changing a thing about a game until its reception starts to sag and the game gets stale. Santa Monica deserves tremendous praise for making such a huge change because it would make the game better and not because people had lost interest. So that's an awful lot said about the old camera system. What about the new one? God of War 2018 features a camera system so good I can't remember one single time it was a problem in just dozens of hours. PSN won't tell you how many hours, but easily 80 hours with this game. That is a tremendous achievement in a game like this. Anyone who's watched my videos probably knows that Soulsborne games are my personal favorites. I have almost no complaints about them outside of things like loading times, but even those games feature dozens of instances per playthrough of wonky camera control. God of War's camera is so good, it is insane to think that this is the first game they've ever developed with a 3D interactive camera system. I don't think I experienced even one instance of it hanging on a piece of geometry or getting stuck on an enemy. I never once died or got confused. Quite simply, God of War has a rock solid, perfectly implemented camera that makes exploration and especially combat a joy. The Granddaddy of the QTE there was a not small risk that switching God of War over to a fully interactive camera system would change the experience so much that it wouldn't be a God of War game anymore. We'll have a whole section later on the things that keep this game firmly in the series, but for now, let's just acknowledge it took some guts to completely revamp a hit game like this. But that wasn't the only huge change the game made. There's another thing that's a fundamental core feature of the early games that's fallen out of favor in modern gaming. God of War featured an insane amount of quick time events. QTEs basically originated with, and if you play this game, you are old, Dragon Lair. Quick aside, I pumped so fucking many quarters into that game as a kid. The original QTE was used at a time when games simply weren't capable of both cinematic quality graphics and gameplay. I pumped quarter after quarter into the frustrating bullshit monstrosity that was Dragon's Lair, not because the game was fun, Looking back, I think it actually was a piece of shit, but because the experience of playing a cartoon was so amazing that even a small bit of interactivity like the QTE felt like a revelation. For anyone watching who is younger, it's probably impossible to understand, but cinema or cartoon quality graphics were a distant, impossible dream in the 1980s. QTEs basically stayed only in the interactive video disc genre for years until the early 2000s. Shenmue was one of the first action games to fully implement them, but God of War might be the most famous example of the QTE. QTEs can be absolutely botched if done poorly. 
In action games, having failable QTEs can destroy the flow of combat and turn a rollicking fight into a tedious session of Simon Says that the player needs to input perfectly to continue. The other common QTE is the narrative QTE, where the developer doesn't trust their story enough to keep the player interested and makes them press X every so often. God of War has historically used almost every flavor of the QTE and leans very hard into them. All of the boss fights had quick time event phases. Most combat situations had QTE finishing moves that provide the player with health and XP for success, but threw the player away for failure. Doors and chests were opened by furiously mashing a button while Kratos strains and grunts, and most cutscenes featured QTE button mashing. God of War was released when QTEs were first becoming pervasive, and it piled them on like crazy. And to be honest, it did them very well. But playing God of War 3 again this last week, it is jarring just how many of them there are, and it's surprising just how difficult they can actually be. Few things in games are as annoying as failing a QTE, and in general, player tolerance for QTEs has pretty much disappeared. The Order 1880 was rightly lambasted for an over-reliance on annoying QTEs. What was once an imaginative and innovative gameplay system is now looked at as a lazy way to implement gameplay without having to bother designing mechanics. Still, while people's tolerance for pervasive QTEs has diminished, a God of War game without QTEs seems like it wouldn't be a God of War game. But God of War 2018 still has QTEs, and they are implemented about as well as any I've ever played. One of God of War's signature features has always been absolutely brutal, hyper-violent finishing moves. And those finishing moves return, but are greatly simplified. In the older games, when an enemy was ready to be literally ripped in half or stabbed in the eye with stone horn, you'd get a button prompt and then have to go through a series of button presses to finish it. The new God of War simplifies this by making finishers happen with only a single press of the right stick. And while this can't be failed like in the previous games, it still manages to be a strategic gameplay mechanic because closing space and spatial awareness are required to pull it off. There are several epic action set pieces that are, as with the old games, highly rely on QTEs, but they're seamlessly integrated here and you only get the button prompts once. After a tutorial section, the game will expect you to do these QTEs without being prompted, producing far more cinematic set pieces than in the early games. It's a simple little change that manages to keep the game true to its gory quick time event roots while making concessions to the expectations of the modern player. Like I said, it's a, it's a small thing, but it's important. The violent finishing moves and QTE boss battle sequences are an important part of the game's history, and they're still here. They're just changed enough to feel completely modern. Finally, like in all other games, Kratos will groan and struggle mightily to open doors and chests and perform various feats of godlike strength while you quickly mash a button. This is something interesting that I'd never really thought about before. I always completely check out a game's settings before I play. God of War, to its credit, has several accessibility settings for those with disabilities. One of those is the option to do QTEs by simply holding the button down instead of mashing. This is an excellent feature for people with arthritis, or injuries on their fingers, or any number of things. Anyway, about halfway through the game, I decided to use that setting and see what it would be like. I kinda hate QTEs in general, and the button mashing has kind of always annoyed me because I'm a hard button presser anyway, and I'm never sure how fast I'm supposed to be mashing, whatever. Strangely, turning this option off made me realize just how much these button mashing QTEs actually add. Opening chests and lifting tremendous boulders felt much less interactive without the mashing of the button. It no longer felt like I was lifting the boulder. It felt like I was watching Kratos lift it in a cutscene. I hate hold X to pay your respects as much as the next guy, but I gotta say, at least in this game, the quick time events actually do add to the interactivity of the game. It was only by playing without them that I realized just how much they did add. I highly recommend you boot the game up and play it for a little bit with the quick time events set to hold to see what I mean. God of War did quick time events right. From Bayonetta to Dark Souls. So for all the talk about what made God of War such a hit, cool puzzles, great boss and enemy design, a fantastic setting, awesome gore, etc. As with most games, none of that would have meant shit if it didn't have a great combat system. Each game in the main life series tweaks the formula slightly, but in general, the game stayed true to its roots as an action hack and slash. Jason McDonald, Santa Monica's lead combat designer, knows his trade, and the switch to a lock-on, Soulsborne-type combat system stays truer to the game's roots than one would think. 
Right off the bat, we should address my bias. I love Souls Combat. It's my favorite ever combat system, so a switch to that system was always going to appeal to me. But as my shitty review of AC Origins, or my meh reaction to Neo shows, just using a Souls type system doesn't mean you'll do it well or have a great game. The early God of War games were combo based hack and slash games, but they also relied on the core of any great combat system. Kratos was powerful, and as such the early games put you up against huge mobs of enemies. By God of War 3 the system already had quite a bit in common with the Souls system. Kratos had a parry move, he had a reliable dodge, his attacks all had wind-ups and recovery periods, and enemies all had very recognizable animations. While researching this piece I found a Gamma Sutra interview with McDonald that he did in 2012 where he talks about the importance of the player being able to reliably read and react to enemy attack animations and the fine balance of feeling powerful but also being challenged. And that same fine balancing is still in evidence today. The new combat system is almost perfectly implemented. Enemies all have exaggerated and recognizable attack patterns and Kratos has a shield with which he can parry. As a really fun wrinkle, enemy attacks that can be parried feature the same yellow glint from the early games, but many of the more powerful enemies are capable of attacks that cannot be parried or blocked and feature a red cue to let you know you have to dodge. The controls are rock solid and tight. The lock-on is intuitive, responsive, and fluid. The parry timing is almost perfect. Forgiving enough to feel powerful but tough enough so that you can't simply parry spam your way through the game. Listen. Bottom line, the combat in this game is fun as fuck. Like any great game, it consistently ramps up its difficulty. You'll start facing a few low level enemies, then you'll be consistently introduced to new enemies that require completely different responses from the player. By about halfway through, the game will throw huge amounts of enemies combining ranged enemies, unblockable melee enemies, and low level mobs all at once, forcing the player to think on their feet and prioritize which enemies need to be dealt with first. The combat has you under constant pressure and there is just enough healing items to deal with it. We'll get into a lot more detail about this during our progression section, but the weapon and skill system here gives the player a large amount of tools with which to tackle the game and accommodates several playstyles. Difficulty settings feel good, with easy being easy, normal feeling good, and hard being challenging but not stupid. I didn't play the hardest setting, so I can't tell you anything about that, but I've read that it completely changes encounters with different enemies rather than simply spongier enemies. And we also need to acknowledge that the real star of this game might be the Leviathan Axe. Kratos has given a bunch of ways to tackle any combat encounter, but the Leviathan Axe might be one of the most fun weapons in gaming history. Its animations are savage and convincing, and attacks feel weighty and powerful. The design decision to have both ranged and melee attacks tied to one weapon was a stroke of genius, making combat encounters have multiple ways they can be tackled. Kratos will gain his signature blades back about halfway through the game, meaning that for most of the game, players will need to fluidly switch between ranged and melee combat with the axe, parrying and hitting with the shield, barehanded combat, the chaos blade combat, magical attacks, and using a trace as bow, it is an awful lot to handle, which makes it all the more amazing that this many intricate systems end up becoming second nature for the player. And of course, Kratos' rage is back, but it is done better than ever before. The animation and mechanic of rage combat makes it visceral and satisfying and the fact that you get a slow heal over time during it adds a real layer of strategy to when the player decides to use it. The basic combat system from the first fight on has a tremendous amount of depth and balances skill, strategy and technique as well as any game I've played. Players need to know how each enemy behaves, which need to be killed first, which weapon works best on them while managing cooldowns and their rage meter. It's as deep a combat system as any player can want. The game manages to mix the absolutely hectic, action-packed feel of the early games with the deliberate, intense, high-stakes combat of Souls. It's one of the greatest accomplishments in gaming in recent times and all the more amazing considering that this is their first attempt at it. With nothing else done well, this game would have been fantastic on the strength of this system alone. But of course, it does other things well too. Very well. Kratos ages with his audience. All right, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Santa Monica Studio. Take a moment to think about 343 Studios or the Coalition Studios. You have the license for a game that was once one of the monsters of the industry. In the case of Halo or Gears of War, you had two studios that were titans who wanted to move on creatively. 
Epic Games and Bungie created two of the best games in history in Gears and Halo. Then they moved on, and Coalition and 343 are left with the licenses. The financial health of you and your company depends upon replicating that success again and again. But every time you make one of those games, it gets less and less special, less and less unique. Having the guts to completely reimagine the mechanics of their game is something rare and special. Imagine 343 releasing the next Halo as a third-person RPG shooter. That's what Santa Monica did here. It's ballsy and gutsy, and there was no guarantee it would work. But very much like Gears and Halo, it absolutely needed to be done, because by 2010, Santa Monica had mined the God of War formula dry. It is important to place the early God of War games in their times. Early video games were toys made for kids, but by the early aughts, the kids who grew up with video games were becoming young adults who wanted to keep playing games. And so a new market for adult themes and cinematic experiences in gaming was just beginning to take shape. God of War was clearly developed to appeal to that young adult audience. The story was a simple but brutal tale of revenge, and the game featured over-the-top gory violence. But it was also still a game caught in two eras, and many aspects of the game feel quite dated playing them today. While the themes and epic cinematic set pieces were early attempts at what games are doing today, other aspects like a running hit counter and commentary scripts like Brutal Kill were straight out of the 90s arcade game. The art design, level design, combat mechanics, and puzzles were well ahead of their time and still hold up fairly well, but the story and voice acting were well short of what we expect from a big budget AAA game. So perhaps it's their greatest accomplishment to have produced a well-paced, simple story with surprising depth while managing to take Kratos from a cool-looking, vengeance-seeking avatar for a young male power fantasy and turn him into a nuanced and compelling take on fatherhood, aging, religion, and the corrupting nature of unbridled power. The early games all managed to occasionally touch on many of these themes, but they never lingered long and made no effort to actually develop characters that felt real. The gods in early God of War games were simply antagonists, things that got in Kratos' way and needed to be eliminated. Certainly there was some characterization of the characters, but this game is on an entirely different level. First of all, the voice acting is uniformly excellent, and that goes for every character in the game. Kratos is a pretty typical man of few words here, but unlike in previous games, the new one actually examines what that means and how it affects those around him. The plot of the game revolves around Kratos and his young sickly son taking the ashes of their wife and mother to the top of a mountain. Kratos has to deal with something every parent struggles with. The balance of knowing the world's harsh and people need to be tough to survive with the pain of watching your kids suffer. Time and again, Kratos will reach to comfort his kid, only to pull his hand back. He'll start to talk, only to stop and grunt. It's one of the best examinations of parenting I have ever seen in a AAA game. Let's real quick take a look at two cutscenes, their acting and direction. One from God of War 3. We are not finished, Zeus. The gates of Hades have never held me. Death cannot hold those with purpose, Kratos. Athena? I have missed you, Spartan. I... I don't... My sacrifice to save Zeus has brought me to a higher existence. You still appear to be an Olympian. Appearances can be deceiving, Kratos. So can the children of Olympus. Perhaps. But remember... My death came by your blade. My blade was meant for Zeus. Be quick with your words. As we speak, the war for Olympus rages on, and mankind suffers. Let them suffer. The death of Zeus is all that matters. And one from the new game. Shut can Help yourself. Can you, mother? No matter what, what I do or say, you won't, you won't stop interfering in my life. I was just trying to protect you. I wa I've made mistakes, I know. But you're free now. You have what you want. Try to find forgiveness. We can build something new. No. No. We can. Because I will never forgive. 
Like I said, games from two different eras. The old God of War was like a cinema blockbuster meant to appeal to 18 year olds who didn't have much to think about. The new God of War is a compelling piece of fiction with real characters and real death. I don't want to spoil the story for those who are getting around to playing it, so we won't stay long here, but I will talk about how the world is fleshed out. The game features a character named Mimir, who whenever you're navigating the world, interacts with Atreus. He tells stories that shed light on Nordic mythology, and much of the game's examination of the behavior of the gods is a pretty clear allegory for the behavior of the most powerful people in our own world. The game asks us to examine ourselves and ask what we would do with godlike powers, or say, godlike political power or money. The gods are shitty because there's nobody to hold them accountable. Two of Thor's sons are running antagonists and they are spoiled, entitled children of power. Drunk, savage, heartless. Now, the narrative is not perfect. It misses on some beats and some changes in Atreus' behavior come and go too fast and aren't really well explained, but in general, the characters here, from Freya and her son, to Thor and his sons, and Kratos and his son, are on a par with The Last of Us when it comes to examining the difficulties of raising kids and the fine line of protecting them versus letting them fail on their own. It is fantastic, and again, so much better than what's come before. An open world. Uh, kinda. God of War made so damn many changes, it was impossible that this wasn't going to be a long video. Anywho, so Kratos is back in a third person Soulsborne, and amazingly, the game has a map and world very reminiscent of Dark Souls 1, by which I mean it's an open world, sorta. God of War is a game that strings dozens of linear, highly designed, meticulously crafted, and stunningly beautiful levels together in an open world with a huge hub area. Most of the world is connected and has to be traversed linearly and requires frequent backtracking through twisting levels until a limited fast travel system is opened up later in the game. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's, it's Dark Souls 1. Now I've said it many times before, I'm getting to the point where when I hear the words open world I get nervous because there are two types of open world and increasingly only one is being made. There's the Assassin's Creed Origins open world that's been done well by like two fucking games in the last 10 years. Aside from Fallout and Horizon Zero Dawn, whenever that kind of open world is released, you can rest assured it will feel almost completely undesigned. You'll have a massive map that you'll wander around aimlessly with cookie cutter bandit camps and almost no feeling of design at all. The kind of game where the map was crafted, then a bunch of assets were randomly scattered before dropping in some gameplay moments. I don't like that. It takes a very special game like Horizon with its fucking jaw-dropping art direction and kick-ass combat, or Fallout with its ridiculous amount of crafted characters and stories to make it work. And then there's the open world of games like Dark Souls 1 or God of War, a series of highly designed, intricately crafted levels that are connected without loading screens and can be revisited or traveled through at will. This type of open world requires you to backtrack through areas and keeps the exploration of the other type without being so big that you are just aimlessly wandering. So, I haven't seen anyone else compare this game to Dark Souls somehow. I mean, I'm sure somebody out there did compare the combat, but I didn't see it yet. But I wonder how many people realize just how much like Dark Souls 1 the world and level design is here. There's a main hub section, like Firelink Shrine. Spoking off from that main section are several visually distinct levels that are more or less linear paths that loop back around in themselves. You navigate these levels by exploring dead ends and areas until you find the shortcut that allows you to move about them easily. It is remarkably similar, and it even rewards exploration in the same way by hiding chests and powerful items off of the beaten path. But it's also a metroidvania. Kratos, and especially Atreus, acquire different abilities throughout the game that allow them to unlock previously closed off areas, and many of those closed off areas are open through clever puzzles. Unlike the earlier games, there is no platforming puzzles. Not even the fucking Dark Souls style platforming. P.S. I don't want Dark Souls to remove those sections necessarily, but Jesus from software. They have gotten more and more fucking stupid. Seriously? This is fucking okay now? <sighs> the God of War puzzles are pretty fucking perfect. They range from feats of skill, like the chests that require you to throw your axe at targets, to simple puzzles, to exploration puzzles. They're just about perfect difficulty for an action game. Most were relatively easy, but there are several tricky ones that required a good bit of thinking also. 
I know a puzzle works for me when it takes a few minutes to figure out, but when I do, I'm like, aha, and not, dude, seriously, how the fuck should I have figured that out? The world is littered with great stories, cool lore, interesting characters, fan-fucking-tastic combat scenarios, tough boss encounters, great side quests, everything. It feels and plays way bigger than it actually is, much like a Souls game. AC Origins map fucking obliterates Dark Souls, or even this game in size, but both of those worlds feel bigger to be in. They feel more substantial because I want to find everything there. I want to unlock the secrets. Except for killing the crows here, there's way too fucking many of them. Otherwise, perfect. The art direction is straight stunning, and the game reuses much of the map by slowly revealing different parts of it as the game goes along. The water level in the main hub area, the Lake of Nine, continuously drops lower as a cool narrative event happens. I don't recall one side quest that wasn't effective. I don't recall one area that didn't look cool. All of them either had a great level, cool story, fantastic character, or a really interesting combat sequence, and most of them had several if not all of those. It's one of the best maps ever in a game. Enemy and Boss Design So God of War does almost everything right. There's one area that could use improvement going forward though. There's a good amount of enemy types here, and most require different techniques and skills to master. There are many very, very cool boss fights that require you to stay on your toes. All of them look cool, but the actual design of the enemies is a bit too similar. There are several different elemental flavors that enemies come in, and this really does spice up the fighting mechanically, but often they feel too much like simple reskins. The rest of the game is so masterfully designed, and previous games had a great variety of enemies, so I'm willing to overlook this this time. The same goes for the boss fights. All of the boss fights are excellent, challenging, long, Soulsborne style fights that test your skills. Especially the really great Valkyrie boss fights that are just straight up Souls bosses. But rather than having 20 visually distinct bosses, you have 9 Valkyries, 3 or 4 of the trolls in different elemental flavors, a few fights with the same story boss. Again, these fights are all excellent mechanically, but because they are really only 3 or 4 bosses, the variety kind of lacks. Now, Santa Monica completely rebuilt this game from the ground up. An all new camera system, map style, narrative style, new combat system, a loot system, a new progression system, it is a completely new game. I understand that compromises needed to be made somewhere, and reskinning really fucking great boss fights and perfectly balanced enemies was a good place to save time and effort. But this is the only thing that keeps the game from being actually perfect. There's more than enough second to second variety in combat when they liberally mix and match enemies and bosses but they could do better. If the next game in the series has 12 unique boss fights and dozens of visually distinct enemies rather than just dozens of reskins of enemies, we'll be talking about one of the greatest games ever made. It's still great. It could be greater though, and hopefully will. Moving on. So, it's an RPG now. God of War has historically had some very light RPG elements. Over the course of previous games, you unlocked and leveled up skills and health and mana. But this God of War is a straight up RPG complete with loot, crafting, skills, spells, and upgrades. It has loot and materials constantly dropping from enemies, and the gear you craft has a material impact on your gameplay. The skill tree is perfectly sized. If you play it nearly to completion, I think I have 85% of the achievements, you'll be able to unlock the entire skill tree and upgrade most of the runic attacks the game has. Now, it is a numbers game in some places. You'll need to upgrade your weapons and your armor to be able to kill higher level enemies because they will just wreck you if you are too low. And usually, I am not a fan of that type of progression. It works here because simultaneously, you'll be unlocking skills slowly enough that the game requires you to master a technique before you unlock another, so it has both. This is progression done properly. Not holding back skills like a fourth gun or a wingsuit just because, but holding back skills to give you time to master the tools you already have before putting more on your plate. It is tuned perfectly, with more advanced techniques like stance switching only unlocking dozens of hours in when the average player will have completely mastered the previous skills. It is player progression, not character progression. It's only when you encounter a game like this that you realize how half-baked and pointless most progression trees are. 
Why is the Destiny 2 progression tree unlocked over time, other than to waste my time? Why does Far Cry 5 hold back a third and fourth weapon for dozens of hours, other than to give you an arbitrary thing to work towards? There is no reason. Destiny 2 isn't holding back a grenade type because it wants to make sure you've mastered one before piling more complex mechanics on you. It's doing it because that's what video games do. But why? God of War is holding back skills in a tree because using them requires actual skill. If all of these skills were unlocked from the start, the player would be legitimately overwhelmed with options. The game starts you with simple enemies and a few simple moves. Dodge, block, parry, swing, and throw your axe. Then it adds things like precision multipliers and axe throws, guard breaking, special cooldown attacks, different context-dependent attacks from holding the button, combo attacks, Atreus attacks, Atreus special attacks, different weapons, stance switching, and more. It doesn't have a node that says 5% more damage. Each of the skill tree nodes add a new gameplay technique. It adds them one at a time, one after the other. You unlock one, you play with it, you get comfortable adding it to your arsenal or deciding you probably won't use it, and then you unlock another. Then the game starts giving you enemies that require the use of these new mechanics. One at a time, it is just perfectly implemented and so carefully designed. It requires and allows time for comfort and mastery before asking the player to do something else. That's a fucking progression system. A player progression system. That's what I mean when I say that. Not a, we held the wingsuit back a few hours because we needed something to hold back for a few hours system. Or a, we held the lightning grenade back for five hours because we're an RPG light and RPGs have skill trees and shit, right? Not that system. Titanfall 2's combat is infinitely deeper and more complex than Destiny 2's, despite having far less tools at the player's disposal. And it doesn't need a skill tree. It just makes the game harder and harder until you learn to adapt. Either have an actual, necessary progression tree, or don't have it and just ramp up your difficulty so the player eventually has to use all the mechanics. It can't be stressed enough. Developers have gotten lazy, or actually forgotten what RPG skill trees were for. World of Warcraft and MMOs have you slowly unlock a skill tree because you need to slowly learn to use each tool, not because everyone else has a skill tree. The progression system here is a shining example of what they can and should be. Bravo, man. I think that's enough. Alright, I have barely touched on a whole bunch of things this game does well, and I barely took any time actually analyzing the story at all, and we are over 10 typewritten pages now. It's time to wrap this shit up. Sony is pretty much fucking killing it with the exclusives. Which kinda sucks, because I vastly prefer the Xbox controller and all of my friends are on Xbox, but compare what Microsoft is doing with Gears and Halo to what Sony just let happen with God of War. Can you possibly imagine Santa Monica going to Microsoft with a plan to completely change everything about Halo? Can you imagine them letting 343 make Halo into a third-person shooter? That's what God of War 2018 is. It's Halo as a third-person shooter, or Gears of War as a first-person shooter. It's that different, and yet, somehow, it stays true to its roots in a way those other games might not even be doing. What was God of War? An adult-themed, brutally violent hack and slash adventure game with puzzles. And that's what we've got here. But it's completely new genre switch from Bayonetta to Dark Souls is so refreshing and different that Sony deserves serious props for letting it happen. And this game is just masterfully crafted. There is no bullshit. There's nothing stupid or pointless. The problems with enemy designs and variety have an obvious and understandable defense. Everything about this game screams loving, meticulous design by a team of fucking pros. The combat is a master class in skill and tension. Its difficulty settings are perfect. Its map is perfect. Its art direction is top notch. Its story is really, really satisfying and intense. Its progression system should be mandatory study for anybody who wants to make a game with a skill tree. It's performance, animations, everything, man. This game rests with Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, Horizon Zero Dawn, Nier Automata, and The Witcher 3 as the best games of this generation. If the bosses had all been interesting, unique designs instead of reskins, and the enemy variety was comparable to a From Software game, it very well might have been the greatest game ever made. As it stands now, it's only one of the greatest games ever made. It does nothing wrong, and has only even a few nitpicks. The last Valkyrie boss is maybe a bit too hard, and requires straight perfection to beat. 
Maybe some of the collectibles are too annoying to find, and it might actually have a bit too much content, but it's as close to a perfect game as anyone has gotten recently. Like the games above, it is a 9.5 out of 10. Enemy and boss design variety away from a 10 out of 10. God of War 2018 is a shining example of game design done right. It's an example of a game that was made by people striving not to make only a commercial success, but trying to make a perfect game. It's the rarest example of a successful company reimagining their own game rather than just passing it off to some other developers to milk it until it dies or just fiddle around the edges and hope that no one notices. It's everything that games can be, but so rarely are. Mechanically, narratively, visually, a work of art. When you play God of War 2018, after you've recently played Assassin's Creed Origins, or Far Cry 5, or Battlefront 2, or any of the biggest games that release every year, there is no way anyone cannot see the difference. One was lovingly crafted to be the best experience possible, with every single system tuned and worked on to satisfy the player. And another was made as quickly as possible to get your money as quickly as possible. I can't say it enough, God of War is about perfect. I can't overstate it, and I can't wait for the next one. All right, bye. I would be like a dog with a bone if you would watch my other videos. And I'd be like a kitty with catnip if you'd like, comment, and subscribe. And if you do all that, I'd be like a bird in flight if you'd let me out of my cage. I wanna fly. All right, bye.